Okay. Uh, it was rather longer much. than I'd hoped, but I kept cutting things out. <laughs> <laughs> thank well, you, thank very you very much, much Ian. That was a, a wonderful talk full of wisdom, insights, and expressed extremely lucidly. Uh, I'm sure we will have many questions for you. But although I think really what we will all need to do is go away and uh, reflect deeply on what you've told us. The uh, coincidence of opposites is not, as you, I think, pointed out, it's not something that comes naturally to us in the time and the society in which we grow up. I was thinking, as somebody who studied the philosophy of technology, uh, of the law of unintended consequences. And that is a pretty universal law when it comes to technology. But when designing technology and implementing it and selling it, it isn't it doesn't seem to be recognized we just think this here we come we've got this wonderful new invention i think it's going to transform your lives always for the better and all mm -hmm. only afterwards oh oh no hello there were it caused well all sorts of side effects yeah. which we hadn't anticipated yeah. however if uh, uh, technologists and engineers were listening to the sort of wisdom that you were bringing to us they would begin by anticipating this Thank goodness, there does seem to be now with the development of AI, some early understanding that, okay, this is a new technology and it can bring good, but it probably also contains things that we'd rather not have and perhaps we need to control it. Mm. Very true, uh, true. I, I, I agree. Yeah, uh, some of the, one of the greatest sh short uh, pieces of wisdom that I carry with me, I think it's from Gregory Bateson, though I've not been able to track down the actual source, is that it's the difference that makes the difference. The difference, yes, that is right. Oh, well, he certainly said to have said that, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. And you, I think you brought yeah. that out again today for us. Yes. There's another lovely thing that I was told by a Jewish friend, that um, some Jews carry two pieces of paper in their pocket at all times to consult, and one says, this wonderful cosmos with all its beauty and complexity and vastness was made just for you. And the other one says, in relation to this vast and beautiful cosmos, you are but a speck of dust. <laughs> yeah. Well, both can't possibly be true, can they? <laughs> yeah. I'll try to get some questions. I just thought that what one so a very significant um, contrary, if you like, that you haven't mentioned is birth and death. Uh, that when you're born, uh, everything that's born dies and everything that dies has to be born. And that mm. I, um, I mean, just experientially, um, the experience of uh, being with someone who dies or sudden mm. death um, has a huge effect and it, it, in a way, I mean, it reminds me of Heidegger, who talks about, you know, existentially, hmm. to be aware of death is hmm. in a more congruent state, where yeah. um, truth um, hmm. uh, arises as a becoming. I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. And of course, not only did I not mention that, but a, a 10,000 things that I could have said, but didn't. <laughs> and, and if anybody's interested in this topic, they can read the chapter, chapter 20 of The Matter With Things, which it, on which it's all based, and there's a lot more there. But yes, Heidegger thought we should be known as the being towards death, because we're aware of death. And one of the things about AI and its supposed intelligence is it can't suffer, and it can't know that it's going to die, and I'm not interested in its observations on life as a result. Um, I don't want to be sympathised with by a machine who doesn't know what it is to suffer. And, you know, th that's another very important, uh, you know, suffering is a very important part of, of, of living a fulfilled life. Which doesn't mean that you should be miserable all the time, of course. But we need to be aware of death, and the, the fact that we're not and we're frightened of death is just an aspect of our foolishness. I, I'm entirely delighted that I've recently lived out my three score year and ten, so I'm officially dead anyway. And you know, if I have a few more days, it's just a gift, and uh, I'm on loan, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with that. But you know, in the past, uh, um, somebody like me would have had a skull on their desk, you know, from the age of. Mm -hmm. 20 or, or earlier and I, 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 so I think it's very important yeah 
Thank you. Veronica, you have your hand raised. So if you'd unmute. Yes, um, well, I've been reading the Bhagavad Gita <clears throat> hmm. and uh, it starts, it seems to start from the premise of delusion <clears throat> that in general, we, when we're born, we're born deluded or we be, we, we're in a, a world of delusion and what we need is knowledge of the supreme reality, which is the knowledge of the Atman or the soul and of, uh, the, the, of uh, the, the reality of God. And then, of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's um, manifested as Krishna. So I, I was hoping that you would comment on that idea that whereas we are born with the idea that we can understand things through book learning, and I know it's ironic I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita, which is a book, but um, we don't, but it's not experiential. It's more um, devoid of that reality that is experiential. So the difference between delusion and knowledge and what is the knowledge that's the most worth having uh, mm. is this mm. knowledge of God or the Atman mm. in the Bhagavad mm. Gita. So I would like you to comment on that, please. Well, thank you. Um, well, first of all, in English, the, we only have one word for, for knowing. But in most languages, there are different words. One is for knowing the facts and the data, and the other is for knowing through experience. So, in, for example, in French, there's a distinction between connaître and savoir, in, French, in German, between canon and wissen. Um, and in each case, the first of those means to know through experience, and the other is to know through, as it were, transmission of, of information. So um, we, we find this more puzzling than most people, and I think that the valuable knowledge is the more valuable knowledge. It doesn't mean there's no value to, to the kind of knowing of facts, of course, but the more valuable knowledge has to be that that is gained by experience. And in the case of God, it can only be gained by experience, in my view. It's no good just poring over a holy text and hoping that that will tell you the answers to things. Um, so, I mean, the idea that we're born deluded is also, for me, probably only as true as that we're born not deluded. <laughs> um, that's already too, too dogmatic an assertion. And I believe we are now deluded, which is why the subtitle of the matter with things is our brains, our delusions, and the unmaking of the world. Because I believe we're unmaking the world that we could know. We're sort of taking it apart and not understanding it through overusing the left hemisphere, which only knows, as it were, uh, or, 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 I mean, all these things are generalizations, but basically knows things from the outside, whereas the right hemisphere is more concerned with our knowledge from the, from the inside, which is what you're talking about. So I think knowledge is always a path. It's always a process. We won't necessarily ever get there. The idea that we can actually, you know, in a finite lifetime, attain total knowledge of God or something seems to me probably a mistake and maybe in itself even a delusion. Hmm. Question to Ian McGilchrist. If, as you mentioned, we live in a left hemisphere world, how do we bring the right hemisphere more into play? Meditation? Hmm. Retreat? Question? That's his question. Hmm. Well, um, there are a number of ways of answering this question. One is at that sort of level, what do I personally do to introduce it more into my life? Um, and I think there's a great deal to be said for particularly mindfulness meditation, which is almost um, purely the business of recruiting <laughs> the way of knowing the world, the non-judging, non-verbalizing way of being present with the world, as Heidegger would have said, or allowing the world to presence, unreason to us, um, rather than the representation of reality, which always comes once the left hemisphere's got hold of something, which it does in milliseconds, and turns it into, I know, I've got it, it's one of those, it's categorized it, it's deadened it. So I think that's right. I think reintroducing into our lives and the lives of children far more rather than less of the humanities. Um, they need to understand history, they need to understand how to think clearly, to challenge ideas, not just to receive ideas. Um, they need to 
be um, I'm trying to think of the way to put it, then they, they need to read more poetry, they need to listen to music and learn to play instruments, all these things to act, all these things are very important in the genesis of a human being who's not just a kind of substandard computer. Um, so all of that I think. But I, I would say that what we need is, is not just to do one or two things in isolation, but to reconceive who we are as human beings. This is the reason I wrote this very long book, is it's an attempt that, as people say, hasn't been made for perhaps a century, to give a complete philosophy starting from the neurological bases going through philosophy and physics to see a coherent vision of who we are, what we're doing in the world. And unless we grasp that, we'll be doing as it were the right things, but for the wrong reasons. And, and that's perhaps better than not doing them at all. But as I often say, if our motive for saving the brain, rainforest is simply that they're very useful in, um, in, the, in preserving a climate in which we can live and that they um, inform part of the trading cycles of the world and all that, then we might as well forget trying to save them because unless we see that they're intrinsically valuable, not just of utility, but are in themselves um, the, the most beautiful expressions of the vitality and complexity and richness, um, the soul of the world, then we're on the wrong track already. So I think it's very important that we, we take on board the message I'm trying to get across. And I know as a psychiatrist that you can tell people what they need to do, but it never works because they need to see it for themselves. And so you need to guide them to a place where they see that they need to do it. If you just tell them they need to do it, they won't get it. So I'm sorry if that's a slightly frustrating point, but it's not entirely hopeless because someone I was talking to or reading, I can't remember which, um, recently, uh, made the point that if 3% only of a population really understand an important new idea, it will become a force in that culture. So I'm just looking for 3% <laughs> of the population to um, try and understand my philosophy and hope that that actually will be in itself a move towards a better future. It's said that we live by the ideas of dead philosophers, and you're very much an alive philosopher. And one thing that worries me is just your three percent. But uh, do we have time for the ideas to filter out? I think we do. I, I sense an enormous hunger for a better way of looking at the world amongst young people and people of my generation too. What pleases me most is that, although I'm not sure that I can say it of this call, but that you know, my audiences when I talk in public are a, a, a whole range of ages from teenagers through to people of my age. So I think there is that need, that desire for something different from the totally bankrupt idea of an entirely materialist reductionist cosmos that is being peddled to us by a kind of half adult version of science that really has no basis in good science. Hmm. Thank you. So it just leaves it to me to thank you very much, Ian, for joining us today for delivering the 2023 Bashara lecture. As uh, Michael has pointed out, the recording of this lecture will be available so I think probably all of us will want to look at it again because there was so much in it and uh, reflect on it and indeed try and take these ideas forward to join the three percent and let's make it four uh, <laughs> percent because indeed, thank you these are important ideas and there's a lot of work to be done